What was the meaning of freedom for African Americans in the wake of the Civil War? This was a time when they were in search both of the meaning of freedom and a search for a place in American society. The great sociologist and activist W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a pioneering book titled Black Reconstruction in 1935. And that book set and has continued to set the tone for every subsequent work on Reconstruction published over the past 80 to 90 years. And one of the more prophetic statements that Du Bois made in Black Reconstruction was this quote. He said, the slave went free, stood for a brief moment in the sun, then moved back again toward slavery. The Civil War marked the first and the only time in American history when one section was invaded and defeated by another section. The defeat of the Confederacy in 1865 produced a legacy of hate, mistrust, and violence unparalleled in American history. The years immediately following the Civil War were known as the era of Reconstruction. Reconstruction, in reality, began at different times and different places. In some areas of the South, it began immediately when the Union Army occupied parts of the Confederacy, such as Port Royal or Louisiana. Reconstruction was not just a Southern problem, it was a national problem, because the war's aftermath was felt all over the nation. But the freedmen, as the former slaves were now known, would be at the center of Reconstruction. And indeed, the slave family would also be at the center of Reconstruction. What was going to be their fate? How would the nation assist them in making the transition from slavery to freedom? Would they be protected by state authorities and the federal government? Or would they be left to fend for themselves? These and numerous other questions needed to be resolved. The freedmen learned immediately that although the Civil War ended slavery, it did not guarantee equality. Former slaves learned of their freedom in many ways. Black soldiers were armies of liberation. Indeed, liberators could be black or white because as many as 180,000 black soldiers were enlisted, volunteered from both the slave states and the free states to fight in this war. Even though the war was fought, according to President Lincoln, to bring the Union, <coughs> succeeded states, back into the Union, African Americans also saw this as a war to end slavery. So 180,000 black soldiers, about 18 to 20,000 black sailors were part of this struggle as well. In Texas, black people learned on the 19th of June, 1865, a day we celebrate, today is Juneteenth, about the end of slavery when the Union General Gordon Granger sailed with approximately 2,000 men into Galveston, Texas and issued General Order No. 3, commonly known as Juneteenth. This has become a federal holiday, although it had long been celebrated by many other states throughout the Union prior to President Biden signing it into law as a federal holiday in 2021. This brief order told the approximately 200,000 freedmen in Texas that they were free, that they could what they could and they could not do. They were advised to remain quietly in their homes. They were told to avoid any sort of retribution. They were told that they should not collect at military posts, that they would not be supported in idleness, and that they were encouraged, yes, encouraged to remain with their former masters and to secure the crop for the present season. Blacks were trying to find and to understand their place in American society, to understand and to test the meaning and the limits of freedom. They also wanted, as the historian Leon, Leon Litwack wrote, in his great book, Been in the Storm So Long, to get the feel of freedom, to raise their own families, to discipline 
their own children and to relieve their wives and their daughters of the burden and the drudgery of field work. They wanted to go to school themselves and to educate their children, and they wanted to work for wages with the hope of a better life for themselves as well as for their families. Reconstruction was a time of cautious optimism for black people. They had some immediate and pressing concerns. One was to simply legalize the marriages that had taken place during slavery. No slave state legalized marriages between black people, unlike other slave societies. They <clears throat> searched for family members, even though they were advised to not roam the roads in the countryside. Family members who had been sold or separated during the time of their enslavement. They dropped the slave names, which they felt were undignified, and they replaced them with many proper names. And indeed, it was during Reconstruction when the letter N in the word Negro, which was used to signify black people at that time, was capitalized for the first time. They learned how to manage a household without white supervision. They were expected to find jobs and to sign labor contracts, and these labor contracts would be pivotal in them becoming independent. They learned how and they understood and it was important that they protect their lives and protect their lives of family members as well. Each of these alone would be great challenges as white Southerners feared change. They feared, among other things, that blacks would push for equality. And they feared that the racial status quo would be undermined. White Southerners also returned home from the Civil War angry and unrepentant. And they used the freedom freedmen as scapegoats for much of their frustration. Not only was this anger and this frustration directed at the freedmen, both men, women, and children, I might add, but also against many Army officers who served in the Freedmen's Bureau as well. Whites generally accepted the abolition of slavery as an outcome of the Civil War, but they rejected the idea of black equality and of black citizenship, or that the freedmen should, should enjoy the same rights as white Southerners. Instead, white Southerners demanded subservience. They demanded obedience and they insisted upon white control. As numerous historians have written, the freedmen should be under white control in much the same way that they had been under white control as enslaved people. One example was the black codes, which resemble, resembled the slave codes and which reestablished white hegemony and placed the freedmen under very strict white control at the state level. Every southern state passed some version of the Black Codes in 1865 and in 1866. They attempted, in the broadest sense, to reestablish a form of pseudo-slavery and to assure whites that the freedmen would be, at best, second-class citizens. The Black Codes did several things. They recognized the new status of black people as free, they legalized slave marriages, they allowed blacks to enter into contracts to sue and to be sued, and they gave them a larger measure of control over their lives. But they also regulated black life in the South from literally sunup to sundown. They compelled black people to work, and indeed one of the most conspicuous features in the Black Code were vagrancy laws, which basically stipulated that if a black person was vacant uh, or idle, even if that person was between work, that he could be arrested for vagrancy, in prison for breach of contract, and would be either uh, in prison at the state facility or a local jail. Blacks could no longer testify in court against white people, although they could go to court and testify against themselves. There were curfew laws, very similar to the curfew laws that had existed under slavery. They could not vote. 
This would be resolved later. They could not possess firearms in many of the states. There were laws regulating speech and conduct toward whites. Again, the objective was to give the South control over their institutions and their people, and also to make sure that blacks, if they ever became citizens, would be second-class citizens at best. One of the more important concerns of the federal government was what should be done by the government to assist the freedmen as well as white refugees after the Civil War. And in March of 1865, a new federal agency, the Freedmen's Bureau, was established for precisely that for purpose. This agency developed out of the War Department, and indeed most of its officers were former military and current military people. This was a multiracial organization. It benefited poor whites as well as blacks, former slaves, anyone affected refugee by the war. Freedmen Bureau had chapters throughout the South, including the state of Texas. And one of the first tasks of the Freedmen's Bureau was to spread the word that slavery had ended. In remote parts of the South or in the West, some blacks did not find out that they were free until as late as November and December of 1865. The Civil War had ended in April of 1865, seven months earlier. Texas slaves, remember, learned of their freedom on the 19th of June. Most Freedmen's Bureau work ended at the end of December 1865. So this was a federal agency, although national in scope, that officially closed its books in 1872. Freedmen's Bureau was headed by a white Union general by the name of Oliver Otis Howard, O.O. Howard as he is known. The major function of the Bureau was to control all matters related to freedmen and refugees. That included the supervision and the management of all abandoned lands. It issued provisions which included clothing, food, and medical supplies. It established schools for many African Americans. This was the first time that they would have the opportunity, including adults, to attend school. And one of the more important obligations of the of Freedmen's Bureau was to supervise and to draw up labor contracts between freedmen and their employers, setting up an arrangement or arrangements whereby blacks and their white employers, white Southerners, entered into contract with terms that were agreeable to both, and the Freedmen's Bureau made sure that those terms and those obligations were adhered to. This was the first effective relief agency that was national in scope, and in many respects it would serve as a forerunner of many of the New Deal programs we're going to see much later in the 1930s. In some areas of the South, the Bureau also helped to organize blacks politically, urging blacks to vote the Republican Party. And this indeed began the long association of blacks with the Republican Party that lasted until the middle of the 1930s. White Southerners hated the Freedmen's Bureau. They viewed it almost from the very beginning with suspicion and mistrust. And they saw it as further punishment and humiliation. Attacks, violent attacks, on both black freedmen and on Bureau Army officers was quite common, including these military officers who were killed in some states, including in the state of Texas. Northerners and blacks, on the other hand, never believed that the Bureau went far enough, that it did not do nearly enough. Educating the freedmen would prove to be one of the greatest accomplishments of the Bureau. Indeed, when General O.O. Howard looked back late in his life upon his accomplishments as head of the Freedmen's Bureau, he was often dismayed. The redistribution of southern farmland, for example, had not come about. The labor system, which Howard had sponsored, had not produced a prosperous and resourceful class of black ag agricultural workers. In fact, almost nothing had been done to give blacks an economic base on which to grow. 
Even some of the early savings banks that the Bureau supported had failed. But education was the one piece of evidence to which General Howard could point to late in life when he sought to prove that his agency had indeed been a success. The Bureau sponsored schools throughout the South. Over 4,000 schools, it employed over 9,000 teachers. Many of these teachers were white missionaries who came from the North or New England, and many were black who had, came, had come from the South as well. The Bureau sponsored not just elementary and secondary schools, but for the very first time, a very small number of black colleges. Howard University, which is named, not surprisingly, after General Howard, Fisk University, many, many others, including in the state of Texas, were established during this era we call Reconstruction. The Bureau believed that the graduates of these institutions, particularly high schools and colleges, would be among the future leaders of the race. Indeed, the great educator Booker T. Washington, who published his own autobiography, one of the greatest selling autobiographies of the 20th century, would write that a whole race of people, he said, went to school at this time. The great black educator and club woman Mary McLeod Bethune would say that the whole world opened up to me when I learned how to read. And Bethune and others of her generation would often learn how to read in these Freedmen Bureau schools. There were numerous obstacles, and some of these obstacles were massive proportions. And the greatest was illiteracy. Up to, upward to about 90% of former slaves could not read or write at the end of the Civil War. And yet, because of 4,000 schools and over a quarter million students who received instruction, great strides would be made in cutting that rate of black illiteracy down tremendously by the 1890s and the early 1900s. By 1877, about 600,000 black students had attended Southern schools, not all of which were Freedmen's Bureau schools, to be sure, but had attended schools in the South by 1877. The other concern was that educating blacks in the minds for many white Southerners meant the fear of losing control. In their mind, black education equaled social equality. And indeed, some Southern newspapers advocated that educating blacks for anything other than menial work was essentially a waste of time. And indeed, many communities would only educate blacks at the elementary school level, some at the secondary level, but very, very few beyond what we call the high school level. This was also a time of great changes politically. And indeed, many scholars, including myself, view the political revolution that took place at the end of slavery. Some of the political triumphs are nothing short of extraordinary. Three constitutional amendments were passed in the space of five years. The first of these, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, Abolish slavery it was ratified in December of 1865, and this was the first time, interestingly, that the word slavery would be used in the federal constitution. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 gave blacks equal rights before the law and the rights of any citizen. The 14th Amendment in 1868 gave blacks citizenship rights because Many abolitionists, many Republican leaders did not feel that the Civil Rights Act of 1866 would go far enough. So they wanted to enshrine citizenship in the federal constitution. The 15th Amendment passed or ratified in 1870 gave black men, though not black women, the right to vote. These amendments, these Civil Rights Acts, literally sent a chill down the spine of every white Southerner. This is precisely what they feared might happen at the conclusion of Reconstruction, and they worked to try to limit these, uh, the, the impact of these bills as much as they could. These bills are, in my, many ways, as I said, revolutionary. 
because on the basis of just the three constitutional amendments, let's think about that for a moment. Prior to the ratification of the 13th Amendment in December of 1865, it had been 61 years, yes, 61 years, since Congress had passed a previous amendment to the Constitution. After Congress passed not one but two Civil Rights Acts during Reconstruction, another Civil Rights Act would not be passed by Congress until 1957 under President Dwight Eisenhower. So on this basis alone, many contemporary historians see emancipation and the broader period that followed, known as Reconstruction, as a revolution. An imperfect revolution, an unfinished revolution to be sure, but a revolution nonetheless. No other slave society in the modern world granted its former slaves the right to vote. None whatsoever. Nowhere in the Americas were former slaves officially granted civil equality immediately after emancipation. And white Southerners, by and large, as I said earlier, did not contest emancipation, despite their disdain for black freedom. A small number of Southern planters were so angry at emancipation and the new black rights that they immigrated to Mexico and Brazil. But the majority, the overwhelming majority, seemed resigned to accept the fact that slavery had ended and that blacks, yes, were citizens, if only second-class citizens. One important way for white Southerners to accommodate to emancipation was to actively engage freed people in the post-war Southern economy. The Civil War shattered cotton culture, as well as tobacco, rice, and sugar production, but Southern planters literally reinvented themselves in the New South. Sharecropping, a new system of labor, emerged, and it became, in effect, the replacement system for slavery. Once it became apparent that former slaves would not be receiving land as compensation or any other form of major compensation, planners, with the assistance of the Freedmen's Bureau, worked out labor contracts between themselves and slaves. And as I said earlier, perhaps the most important function beside education of the Freedmen's Bureau. Many planters, however, disliked sharecropping because they said it empowered the freedmen. It gave him or her a voice, a say, unlike the system of slavery. But nonetheless, once these contracts were worked out, each side, if they believed that they were fair to themselves, would try to live up to the bargain. And so tenant farming, as well as sharecropping, would be the major forms of labor for the freedmen after Reconstruction. Freedmen had little money. Some tried to pull their money, some did pull their money together to buy land. Land was in short supply. Without the capital to purchase land in the post-war South, the choices were, were quite slim. One could either work as a sharecropper or as a tenant farmer, or one could migrate out of the South. And indeed, tenant farming not only affected African Americans, it infected many whites as well. Uh, a number, an undetermined number of these individuals became so poor and indebted to their employer that they were trapped in a pernicious system we know as debt peonage, where they are legally bound, and their children and their families are legally bound to remain on the farm or a farmer plantation until their debt was paid off. Many white farmers were also victimized by this system as well. The most assertive African Americans, however, migrated either out of a county where they felt that there was not enough opportunity. This is a period of migration where blacks are leaving rural areas increasingly migrating to cities where they worked jobs other than agriculture. And one of the first major migrations out of the South would take place right at the end of Reconstruction, known as the Kansas Exodus, where blacks, at least from the Upper South, came together. They formed seven or eight all-black towns where they hoped 
to not only have a better life economically, but also have a better life for their children as well. Leaving the South, however, was difficult. This had been their home forever, right? It was expensive to leave the South, but also they didn't know where to go. This is also a time in American history, in Southern history, when blacks do pretty well politically. When they vote, they vote the Republican Party. As a great black leader, Frederick Douglass, would say on more than one occasion, the Republican Party, he said, was the ship and all else was the sea. And indeed, it was during Reconstruction when the first black politicians were elected to the United States Senate and the United States Congress, and hundreds of black elected officials were elected at the state level. Two black senators, both from the state of Mississippi, Hiram Revels, a African Methodist Episcopal minister, had been a free black, a Civil War recruiter, would be elected to the Senate in 1870 and serve the expired term, ironically, of the Confederate President Jefferson Davis. In 1874, Blanche K. Bruce, another free black, would also be elected to the Senate, and he would be the only black person elected during this era to serve a full time in the United States Senate until 1966. He had been born a slave in Virginia, but he escaped during the Civil War. He went to Mississippi in 1869, where he entered politics, and he moved up the ladder. Hundreds and hundreds, about 800 in total, black politicians were elected to state office and to state government. Louisiana alone had 133 black legislatures between 1868 and 1896. Blacks served as lieutenant governor in a number of states. They even served as acting governor in some states, but they did not serve as governor. But this is a remarkable achievement because blacks not only were allowed to vote, black men I might say, but they also had that vote protected and they tended to vote as a bloc, much like white Democrats did as well. This is also the time when the first black people under the protection and the guidance of the Republican Party began to apply for admission to the military academies, particularly West Point, and they had not only to pass the rigorous entrance exam, but also to endure the stiff academic competition and also the very stiff harassment that they faced. The first group of black people did not fare so well. They were harassed almost endlessly. They were silenced, and by silencing, silencing I mean they were not addressed or spoken to unless it was an official matter. Can you imagine going to school, to college, to graduate school, and not being spoken to for three or four years by your classmates? In addition, some of these individuals were brutally beaten up. None of them survived the early admission. It would not it be until 1877 when the first African American, Henry O. Flipper, graduated from West Point. Only three black graduates would graduate in the 19th century, and it would be about a half century later until the next black person would graduate. So blacks, once again, were trying to understand the meaning of freedom. And one of the things that they had to constantly worry about was racial violence. Some of the most brutal race riots would take place during the era of Reconstruction. New Orleans, Louisiana, Memphis, Tennessee, small towns, the Colfax Massacre in Louisiana, when dozens of black men, and yes, women and children as well, were murdered without reason, without cause, simply because they were trying to exercise their constitutionally protected rights. In many cases, white Southerners were angry that blacks had in fact voted, that they even registered to vote, 
and even more angry that they exercised that right and had been successful in putting blacks into political office. So oftentimes they were angry that the black militias were still operating in many Southern communities. And one of the first tasks of white Southerners after they gained control of their particular community or their state was to disarm as many of these black militias as well. They tried to do this because they knew that black people, as they had shown during the American Civil War, would fight for their freedom. They would fight to protect themselves and to protect their families. And so once these militias were disarmed and there was very little question that black people in the communities would be protected by whites in places like Louisiana or Tennessee, it was literally open season. So some of the worst, the most vicious race riots that often don't make their way into history textbooks, either at the high school or the college level, would take place during this time. So the meaning of freedom obviously meant different things at different times, but it meant, again, getting a sense of how far one could go. What were the limits on black people? What were the limits on their families? Again, I think everyone understood that they would not be equal to whites. But this cautious optimism began to die down toward the end of the era of Reconstruction, particularly so when the Ku Klux Klan organized throughout the South under the Grant administration, and initially very little would be done to stem this tide. General Grant, who had supported colonization of blacks outside of the United States, as had Lincoln, as had many politicians, did, however, use the power of his office and the U.S. military to try to crack down on the Klan in the American South. He was fairly successful, so much so that Frederick Douglass would say that basically the scouring of our people has pretty much ended because of the courage of Ulysses S. Grant. Ironically, very few of these Klansmen, despite their atrocious acts against freedmen, would ever serve a one day in prison because they would not be convicted by state prosecutors or juries throughout the South, which continued to terrorize black people throughout much of the 19th and well into this 20th century. Reconstruction finally comes to an end in 1877, after a very controversial election in 1876, which was rife with corruption. But following the installation of Rutherford B. Hayes as President of the United States, Hayes stood firm with a campaign promise that he would remove the last remaining federal troops from the South. Following the last remaining federal troops from the South, basically the South had autonomy. They had the authority to govern the, their people, including their former slaves, in any way that they saw fit. And they had the assurance, more or less, that there would be no interference by the federal government. So this is precisely what W.E.B. Du Bois meant when he said, the slaves went free, they stood for a brief moment in the sun, and then they moved back toward slavery. He certainly got that right. 